Welcome to A Cloud of Witnesses. My name is Robert Pears. In this episode, we are going to look at the Ulster Revival of 1859. I want to show you that revival truly is a divine assault on society, and we need that today. We are beginning to feel the rain of the end time season, and the spirit of Antichrist is clearly growing all around us. The persecution of Christians is on the rise, and the moral decline in this nation has never been greater. It's coming now at great cost for us to stand up and confess that we are Christians and hold fast to our beliefs. This is not a generation that rejects God, but rejects Christianity and Jesus Christ. It is the core beliefs that we believe in that are being challenged, and you're being put in a position where you must compromise those beliefs to be seen as politically correct and unhateful. But the Word calls us to make a stand, to make a stand for righteousness. We live in an hour where it seems that evil is good and good is evil. People have received a delusion and don't look and open their eyes to see what's really going on. That is the job of the church, to be a voice, to stand up and say the truth. We are salt and light. And it's time for us to rise up and understand the hours and gather together. Throughout Throughout history, it has appeared many times that the church was about to fail, as I will show you. But God, every time God would step in and intervene when the church got together and began to cry out and seek heaven until he moved. God is longing for his body to gather together. This move is not a move based on denomination, but it is a move based on relationship. I love the Ulster Revival because I grew up there. It was a nation that was divided, a nation that was bitter, a nation where you saw Catholics against Protestants and Protestants against Catholics. But God, when God stepped in in 1859, everything changed. God began to bring the people back together, and I believe He had a bigger purpose. And if men had a surrendered all, if men had a laid hold of getting rid of that bitterness of the past, so often we are captivated by the scars of the past and the fears of the future. And it hinders our walk with the Lord. But God must have complete access to all of us. He is Lord. When man fell at the garden, the devil came to Eve and said, Did not God say? He never said, The Lord God. And as you read the Old Testament, you will see that when God is dealing with creation, He is God. But when he's dealing with man, he is the Lord God. Because he is Lord, he is the one who carries final authority. We are supposed to walk in submission to his word, whether we like it or not. See, we change with every generation. We have different opinions of what's right and what's wrong. I look back at church history, and if I go back almost 100 years ago, we see Azusa Street which birthed many of the Pentecostal movements or churches of today. It was started by a black man in a time where black people were, I would even say, less than second-class citizens. But in God's eyes, there was no difference. Because at that hour, that's what was politically correct in the minds of men. But God does not go by the minds of men and the thinking of men. God is consistently the same. He never changes. He made his opinions in the eternal past, and they will be the same in the eternal future. His word is forever established. It is the rock. Jesus said, I will build my church upon the rock. The church are the people, the disciples of the time understood because they called God the rock. You are the rock of my salvation. And they understood that he was referring to Jesus being the rock. Not a man, not a denomination, but Jesus. Jesus is the rock on which the churches stand, and the gates of hell will not prevail against us. As I look around and I see the attack against the church, I can tell you this. I've read the book. I know how it ends. The church wins because Jesus is Lord. The church will not be defeated. The church is not going under. The church will rise up victorious. 
We are coming to a place where we must realize that we are hopeless and weak, but we must boast in our weakness and boast in the cross because it is Jesus and by His Spirit that we overcome. This is the hour where God is about to show that He is in control. In 1859, in Ulster, God stepped in and He took a nation and began to move. And I want you to see that God's kingdom was being beginning to be manifested in that nation. And it wasn't about denomination. It was about those that are called by the name of Jesus. In this hour, God knows His own. And He's calling to His own. And He's seeking for those that will hear His voice and come to Him. I don't care what denomination you are born in. I don't care uh, if you think you know Jesus. I'm more concerned, do you know Him? Do you have a relationship with Him? Because Christianity is not about a denomination. Christianity is about a relationship. And if you know Him, do you want to know Him more? He must come, abide in the inside of us, and He must become Lord of all of our lives. Well, it's always important to strive for doctrinal purity and not to just say, hey, kumbaya, we're all one, we work together. Mm -hmm. But God knows those who are His. 2 Timothy 2.19, one of the two sure foundations, the Lord knows those who are His. Mm -hmm. And then the other, let everyone who calls on the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. So among the true people of God, uh, a revival will find them. Among the true people of God, a persecution will often bring them together. Okay. And what we see in America is great opposition, yes, to God on the one hand in terms of the new atheism and the attack on God, but then very specifically attack on conservative Christian biblical values, these foundations. And that joins us together with believers in other parts of the world who are suffering severe persecution, but they may come from different faith traditions, yet they're brothers and sisters in Jesus. So you can look at who is the devil attacking, uh, who is the world attacking. That probably gives us commonality in the Lord. And one thing that happens in revival is, as it's often said, when the waters rise, you can't see the fences anymore. The man-made fences need to be put down. Those fences that are right because they're separating truth from error and the people of God from, from deception, those fences are important. But the other man-made fences need to come down. When we need each other more, a lot of our petty differences will disappear. around. I pray in the name of Jesus that your eyes be open to see what's going on all around from heaven's perspective and that heaven is on full alert, that heaven is disturbed and God is beginning to beget to rise up and say it's time to judge the earth. But he's calling to his church to begin to cry out, to seek him because why? There needs to be a harvest of souls. It says that Jesus waits long for us to repent he waits long for the harvest of souls to come from the earth. We act in judgment. God acts in mercy. Everything God does is based on mercy. We must come to the place where His nature flows from us, that what we do is out of love and worship for Him. Our ministry is an act of love, where love and His life begin to flow from us, and God is lifted up, not a man or a denomination. It's about Jesus. Many people build their um, prestige or their, 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 their power, their um, respect based on their legacy and their history. Well, look at our grand buildings. Look at our long history. I'm not concerned or interested in that. I'm interested in do you know him? In Matthew chapter 7, around 21 through 23, I believe, Jesus says, In that day many will come to me and say, Did we not uh, do miracles in your name? Did we not cast out devils in your name? Did we not prophesy in your name? And he says, I will say to them, Depart from me. I know you're not you who practice lawlessness. You're not submitted to my word. You're not submitted to my lordship. 
going back where I was talking about the devil approached Eve and said, did not God say? But see, a God is someone we can control and manipulate because a God is based on how we perceive things. And I can manipulate a God. But the Lord God, I can't because he has final authority. It's his way or the highway. The devil doesn't have a problem with you accepting Jesus as God. He doesn't like it when you say Jesus is Lord. The Bible says that you are saved by confessing that Jesus is Lord, not that he is God. He is the Lord God. You look at the various revivals that have occurred. Smith Wigglesworth spoke about a coming revival being the greatest revival ever. The church is not going out broken, defeated. We're going out victorious, Amen. which we are not. Right. What are your thoughts on this upcoming revival? What's it going to be like compared to previous one? How much is it going to be different? Well, we don't know because we've not seen it. We've just said that we've not walked this way before. But if in the book of Acts it was tremendous, how much more, I think, would it be? We're, we, we need, maybe it's because God is... Maybe what we're all sensing is done with the church as usual, done with everything as usual. God is forming in us new wineskins. New wineskins right. to contain the new I wine. We don't know. We don't know what it's going to be like. We, we know this. It's going to have to be uh, marked with strong power of God and demonstration right. of not just the gospel being preached but it, and not just the gospel being proclaimed but being manifested. Yes in a real way where we're going to, I believe one of the biggest things we've seen attacking people more than ever is cancer. I believe we're going to start to see, uh, my faith is that, my hope and my faith is that we are going to see people that have suffered from dread diseases just be healed instantly. And, and uh, like they saw in Azusa tumors falling off where they would sweep the floor every night from the tumors. Can you imagine? Have so, we ever seen that yet? So I go that many. love and mercy. Even his judgments are based out of his heartbeat, which is love and mercy, and seeing men come to the knowledge of him because of what he has for us. He has something great for us. He wants to buy, abide with us and spend time with us and have fellowship with us and to love on us. So as we look at this Ulster revival, I pray it provokes you, but I also pray that it gives you a con concept and a revelation of what revival is really like and that you would get a desire for it. I want to share real quick with you um, from Charles Finney because Charles Finney shared when to expect revival. I'm just going to give a few of these. When there's a want of brotherly love and Christian confidence among those who profess. We've come to an hour where Jesus said uh, that because of the increase of lawlessness, the love of many believers would grow cold. And we're seeing that because um, as Alexander Dowie talked about his wooden hut outside the World Fair in Chicago in 1893. He said, the world passed by, the church, the church passed by, and they would not stop. Why? Because the church was robed with the world. We have become so much like the world. Jesus said, and speaking to the church of Laodicea, uh, um, you are neither hot nor cold. How I wish that you were either hot or cold. It's not that you're doing bad. He said, I see your good works. We're full of good works. We are a church that abounds in good works, but good works don't please heaven. Are we on fire for God? Do we have that relationship with God? Because being on fire for God causes us to have a fervency in seeking Him, spending time with Him, and getting to know Him. Continuing on. When Christians conform to the world and dress and material possessions, parties, seeking worldly amusements, reading novels and other books such as the world reads, it shows they are far from God. We've come as the parable sower talks about where we are along the roadside and we are stony ground and it chokes the word, it prevents the word of being productive in our lives and bearing fruit, which is all about souls for Jesus. We are meant to be witnesses of that Jesus is Lord because of the new nature and life flowing from us, the Word producing fruit in us and through us. 
When the church finds its members falling to gross and scandalous sins, that brings a reproach on his name. We're living in an hour where, as I said, evil is good and good is evil. We have forgotten the law of God. It's not about my opinions of the law. It's not about how I see it, because God established his word in the eternal past. His law is forever settled. Uh, when there's a spirit of controversy in the church, we truly are seeing where things that would never be named in the church are beginning to happen in the church. It is not love to allow souls to go to hell. We are meant to be a voice to reach out because we have an answer that is Jesus for what the people are enduring and going through. We have a life that they need. We have a joy and a peace, but it comes on the conditions of surrendering and declaring Jesus Lord. When the wicked triumph over the church and revile them, and we're seeing that, we're seeing the government and government agencies beginning to dictate the church, this is what you will do and this is how you will do it. And they are limiting our Christian liberty that was bought by the blood of Jesus and the blood of the saints and the martyrs in the previous generation. It's time for us to make a stand. It's time for us to rise up. Um, when sinners are careless and stupid and seeking to hell unconcerned. And the church has no burden for souls. Revival is indispensable in averting the judgment of God from the church. To prevent the church from annihilation. When the providence of God indicates that a revival is at hand. And I pray that you're beginning to feel that the Spirit of God is moving on the earth saying, I'm about to move. I'm going to pour out my Spirit upon all flesh in this hour. And we need to be ready. We need to be a wise virgin that has her lamp full of oil because we know Jesus is about to move and He's coming soon. Hallelujah. Let me share with you a couple things to show you in previous generations the church faced hours where it looked like the church was about to be annihilated. The Chief Justice of the United States, John Marshall, wrote, The church was too far gone ever to be redeemed. And this was just after the revolution. Voltaire averred and Tom Paine echoed, Christianity will be forgotten in 30 years. Men began to focus on um, rational thinking. We were Lord. And that thinking has continued till today. We have science and we have rational thinking. And somehow we think we are God and we know everything. And God's about to show that He is Lord God. And He is the one who made us, created us, and He is the one who knows all things. A poll taken at Harvard had discovered not one believer in the whole student body. And that was a, a university created by Christians. It was meant to be a Christian university. Yet it came to a place, and is much like that today, where there was not one Christian named among them. We see in that hour they were mocking Christianity or putting it on a Christian place. And it was all acceptable to mock Christianity. You can try... This is something that comes out of holy desperation. When we begin to look at the Ulster Revival in 1859, it starts with a woman around 1857 coming over a Baptist missionary lady, Mrs. Colville, out on the streets preaching. It is so easy for us to look at street evangelism and say, what power is it? Is it just a waste of time? But we never know whose life we're touching. That day in the crowd was a man called James McQuilkin. He hears her. And there's a woman that challenges Mrs. Colville on predestination. She says, you don't know Jesus. And that would touch James such that over the next two weeks, he struggled with it. God had got a hold of his heart. When God gets a hold of your heart, it begins to challenge you. And finally, after two weeks, he accepted Jesus. then begin a prayer meeting and he would pray in more members until they became four. They were part of the Connor Church and their church pastor uh, challenged them to be something, do something great for God, something bigger for God. We need pastors that challenge us, that dare provoke us. At that time, the Great Awakening was beginning here in the United States.
of this revival and they started to get a fire and a passion for it. These men began to read uh, of what Charles Finney was saying and George Mueller. And they believed, God, if you moved in a previous generation, you can move in ours. Let's get a hold of that. God, if you moved in a previous generation, you can move in ours. And with that, they began to pray and lay hold of the promises of God and get in agreement with heaven and see those purposes and promises birthed on the earth. We must do the same. Revival is not birthed out of a quick little prayer. It's birthed out of a season of pressing in. It says the fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. It's a prayer that's intense. It's an intense spiritual cry from our heart. It's a hunger and a desperation that drives us into the secret place. and says, God, will you not move? Father God, remember your people and see them in your mercy. We decree the blood. We stand on the blood. We cry out. There's a cry from my spirit that will not be silent. Oh, the book of Romans says in 8, all of creation groans for the revealing of sons. I believe it's crying out, let those rise up who are the sons of the living God who stand and say, Jesus, you are Lord. We press in for heaven to move in this hour. And after a season of praying, and it takes a season. Evan Roberts had to pray for a season. He prayed intensely in such that he was kicked out of his apartment. Every revival is birthed through a season of intercession. It is the foundation stone of which revival is brought. Revival is a divine assault on society. I look at the Elster Revival, and starting with it, it was a Gideon, the least of the least. He was an insignificant person, as I said, in the middle of nowhere. A lot of people look and say, I'm, I'm a nobody. But I would say God's looking for Gideons. First, in God's sight, nobody is anybody. Paul writes to the Corinthians and said, neither he who waters uh, is anything, he who plants, is, uh, nobody. It's God who gives the increase. He said, we have this treasure in earthen vessels, so the excellency can be God's power. None of us are healers. None of us are saviors. None of us are deliverers. But God saves and heals and delivers through us. It's all Him. So when we start there, we understand there are no superstars. It's all His Spirit, and His Spirit could work through any yielded vessel the same as another one. Secondly, many of those that were greatly used in revival, say Evan Roberts in the Welsh Revival, 1904, 1905, he was a nobody. He became internationally known because God used him, and then he withdrew from the public spotlight and spent the, the bulk of the rest of his life after the revival given primarily to, to private prayer. That was his great ministry. But whoever heard of him before, he was a 26-year-old coal miner. Right. He was nobody. He was unknown. When God moved, he became known. It's the same with many of the great historic moves. You know the people now. Their names are famous because of how God used them. But going into it, they were unknown. The bottom line is God's looking for yielded vessels. Evan Roberts had a burden on his heart. He travailed for, for a good year and agonized in prayer and cried out and groaned. And, and to the point his landlord kicked him out. You know, because he was groaning in prayer and preaching to the walls. Uh, for years, he would never miss a church service because his pastor had said, you, you never want to miss, you never know when God's going to move. So he'd work in the coal miners, filthy and dirty and tired, but he'd still get ready to go to the service because he didn't want to miss a church service. This went on 12, 13 years, and then the hunger rose, and he became more and more desperate. And he began to pray fervently, God, bend the church, save the world. And then he gets this message. He's a Bible school student, a coal miner, 26 years old. Tells his pastor he has a message to share. They said, okay, uh, let's talk to the young people after the meeting. So he just gets a number of young people. And he speaks four things to them. They need to confess the sins and repent and get right with God and things like that. God starts to move. Well, let's do it another day. Let's do it another day. Next thing you have the historic Welsh revival. Yep. So it's always nobodies through whom God uses. In fact, many times it's insignificant places. Why Azusa Street a few years after the Welsh revival? Who was William Seymour? He was a nobody. He'd, he'd been a waiter. He, he, he pastored a tiny little black church, blind in one eye. I, I mean, when the guy went to go to a Bible school in, in, in Kansas, 
the, the, the white leader of the school said, okay, we'll accommodate you. You can sit outside the, the classrooms and listen because they were still so racist. They wanted to open the door to him, but they couldn't have a black man in classes with him. This, this is the environment. And, and he goes to this building. It, it used to be a, a, a stable. It was a church building and a stable and back and forth. They start holding meetings. They're all unknowns, every one of them. But God moved, and that's why Pentecostals, Charismatics around the world all know the name of William Seymour. Uh, and, and what does he talk about? Desperate hunger. Hours and hours and hours of prayer and then crying out. And then the breakthroughs came. That's how it works. We can preach all that we want. We can give up tracts and do all these great things. But if it's not backed by a season of prayer, so that what we do comes out of the life of Jesus in us, flowing from us. We need to get into the secret place and be baked and marinated in his, in his presence until we are changed. And the life of Jesus is in us and it flows from us. So when I preach the word, what you receive is the life that is in him coming through me, this vessel. He has put this glory in earthen vessels that the, oh, Jesus might be lifted up and the world might say, it's Jesus, not me. There's nothing that I have. Silver and gold I have, have I not, but I have Jesus. I give you Jesus. We must come to the place where we are circumcised in heart through the time and the season, seeking God in the secret place until God moves. That is what... Well, we're on our way to Connor in County Antrim, Northern Ireland. It's a small town that was founded in 482 by St. Patrick, a man who had a burden for souls. This revival was the greatest revival since the days of St. Patrick in Ireland. And as you can see, we're in the Irish countryside, we're south of Balamina. Yet in this rural setting, God birthed an incredible revival that touched over one million people um, that really changed that generation and is impacting even ours. We're at that Connor church and not far from here, uh, across the bridge is the town of Kells. And it was there that the four men met at a schoolhouse and had their prayer meeting that birthed this revival. I wanted to share uh, quickly this testimony of a small schoolboy uh, who was changed during this revival uh, because many children were impacted. And he is sent home because he is so disturbed and agonized by sin by his, uh, his teacher. And he is sent home with a convert, another child who has already received Jesus. And on the way home, they see a house that is open and empty, and they go in and they begin to pray, and the little boy receives Jesus. So they return to school, and he tells the master or the teacher, I'm happy, um, I've got Jesus in my heart. He goes outside, and the schoolmaster looks outside, and he sees these boys praying, and it causes great conviction to come on the, on the school, and so that they have to call for ministers to help pray for the people there, uh, for the other teachers and the students that God used even children in this revival to touch lives of people and bring people to the knowledge of Jesus. God is dealing with the church in this hour and he's saying, church, will you not rise up? Church, will you not seek me? Church, I want to change you, transform you, take you from glory to glory. It's time for us to look in the mirror of his glory and see the image of who he says we are and allow him to change us from glory to glory by his spirit as we abide in the word and abide in prayer. Well, in 1859, these men um, began to preach. They finally go to Og Hill. And they preach a word at Og Hill at the Second Presbyterian Church. They share their witness. And many begin to gather because while they heard about some of the converts from their earlier preaching, we need to dare step out and share what we've got. We've got Jesus in our life. It should make such a difference that it should be so natural for you to, do, to share Jesus. As an apple tree bears apples, you are meant to bear fruit. A good man from his good treasure brings forth good fruit. What's inside of you will come out of you. And for too long, what we've had on the inside of us is the world. It's time we had the church. Sorry, we had the Lord Jesus and the Spirit. And it starts to flow from us, this good fruit of heaven. Because when people see that fruit, they see the peace, the joy, the power, it draws them to it. Well, we've left Connor and we're on our way to Og Hill. And as you can see, we're in the Irish countryside, and this road 
would have been even smaller back in the days of uh, James McQuilkin. But God was able to get his message all the way from this rural town throughout the whole of Ireland into Britain and touch the world. I wanted to share with you uh, from Peter's message on the day of Pentecost, where in Acts 2, uh, verse 37, I believe, where the people that heard Peter preach said they were pierced to the heart and asked, what can we do to be saved? When the Spirit of God turns up, he always begins to convict people of sin. As you look here, we're looking at the church in Og Hill. And again, when the people gathered, they were convicted by the Spirit of sin. And it caused them to begin to prostrate, to get down the ground and cry out and seek God for mercy. And we see that throughout this revival that life's uh, people were so touched that they would just get down the ground and begin to cry out. They were agonized by the sin in them and truly needed God. I have to imagine back in the time of revival on the street looking and seeing people either crying out for salvation, God have mercy on me, or being filled with great joy and rejoicing that they had found Jesus. The second week they go to the First Presbyterian Church and the revival begins to break out in March of 1859. It would spread throughout the whole country, the whole of Ulster. It would go into Britain and over one million people would be added to the church. We're not talking about uh, Christians because they couldn't talk about the backsliders that came back. They're talking about people added. So that doesn't give you a full uh, reflection of what a really how big this move of God was. And it impacted every denomination because God was looking for a harvest of souls, those that were hungry for God. In this next move, it's not going to be a denominational move. It's going to be a move of the Spirit where God knows His own and calls them out. Blessed are those who hear His voice and run to Him. Blessed are the people that will stand up and go share the gospel because how will they hear unless they, uh, that somebody preaches it to them? That is our job. So... It spreads throughout the whole nation. A nation that at one time had been divided and bitter. God begins to move. And it started in Connor. I love that. I want to share with you, if I may, some of the quotes and some of the things said regarding this revival. This is a nation that's not on fire for God. It's lost the passion. It's lost the, the, the desire to go after the things of God. And that's where we are in the United States. This is where I see throughout the world many people have lost the fire and the passion because we've lost the relationship. We've lost how good God is. But listen, so intense was the desire after the things of God that it was recorded of one district. Whole townlands are awakened. All out their labor suspended, and the people in crowds follow the minister from door to door to engage in prayer. I look at the heroes of faith, and I guess the question comes, do we need the God of power? We've got marketing. We've got modern medicine. Do we need the God of power? Without the God of power, we don't have the gospel. The gospel is the living demonstration that Jesus has risen from the dead. The gospel is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes. Our message is not with words only, but with power. These are quotes from the New Testament. When we receive the Holy Spirit, we receive divine power to enable us to be witnesses because ultimately this is a spiritual battle. Marketing cannot save a single soul. Marketing cannot produce a single disciple. Uh, the world's best media cannot bring one person from spiritual death to spiritual life. It is only the power of the gospel that does it. What happened is we've leaned on the arm of flesh because we can do things we couldn't do before. Uh, we can plant a church just by getting word out uh, through different media methods. And next thing we've got a church, well, do we have disciples? Uh, I'm, I'm all for using every tool we can use. I'm all for taking advantage of the technology and doing things with excellence on every level. 
But let's not mistake that for the power of the gospel. So maybe we can network with more people and reach more people. I can take out my cell phone and be talking by live video stream to people all around the world. But unless there's power and anointing in the words that I'm speaking, unless I'm rightly preaching the gospel of Jesus, unless that truth is penetrating hearts in a life-changing way, all it is is just another sideshow. We become very much flesh dependent. Years back, A.W. Tozer pointed out and there was a very different world then than today when he wrote this over 50 years ago. But that if the Holy Spirit had left the church in the, in the first century, 95% of all of their ministry would have stopped. If the, if the Holy Spirit left the church in North America today, 95% of our ministry would continue unaffected. That's a sorry testimony for the state of the body. Bible was so big that the churches couldn't hold the people. They had to shut the door and say, don't come in because we're frightened. If you come in, there's too many of you and the building will collapse. They started to gather in outside meetings. For example, in the town of Port Rush that had a population of less than a thousand people at the time, over 2,000 gathered. Belfast would see gatherings of 20,000. Derry, 5,000. These are large numbers. These are a considerable large percentage of the population gathering multiple times a day to seek God and to pray. Labor stopped. People stopped working because they were desperate for God. You'd walk down the street and you would hear people either praising God or crying out for mercy. Even the children were impacted. The children would begin to pray. They would get in houses and they would pray. People going by would see it. They would come in and be so convicted by the presence of God, they would hit the floor and begin to cry out. And a minister would have to come to deliver the people so stricken in agony because of the awareness of their sin and their desperate need for God. In the revival days, no false shame hindered the repentant sinner from expressing with all naturalness his actual feelings, hence stricken remorse. Men, women, whether respectable churchgoers or of flagrant life, sought the Savior with agonizing cries, uh, which were an indication not of a mental fantasy, but of profound realization of the spiritual need. They suddenly got that they needed God. Jesus said, when the Spirit comes, He will convict the world of sin first. The Spirit is still the same Spirit. And when He turns up, He begins to clean house. He convicts of sin. And there comes a fear of the Lord upon the people, which is what we saw in those days. I'm going to give you many quotes, um, as you'll see on the screen, from the revival to show you what it was like in that hour. God was moving and the people were beginning to break and be changed, and a joy and a peace came to the nation. Another psalm I sung, and now the converts rush in among friends and neighbors, shouting and pleading with heavy hearts, or heaving hearts, and sparkly eyes, and beaming countenances, and in strange sweet tones, telling of their newborn joys. The multitude heaves to and fro like a ship in a storm, and like drunken men uh, in the streets, the people stagger and fall with a shout or deep sigh. Tears are shed and groans as if dying men are heard. Prayer and praise, tears and smiles mingle together. Husband and wives locked in each other's arms, weeping and praying together, while those who come to scoff stand still and in fear and trembling contemplate the strange thing that is going on before their eyes.
God was moving in such a powerful way that you were challenged wherever you were at. You could not stay the same. You either accepted and ran with it or you stood back in fear of it. Because when the Spirit of God begins to move, all heaven is loose and it will cause people either to be drawn to the light or to be repelled from it. As you pass down the street, you hear in almost every house the voice of joy and melody. We need that today. We need God to step in and begin to restore the family and the home. This nation has been torn apart by a political agenda. It is time we saw the kingdom of God released. We have something, church. We have Jesus. We have lost sight of what he really is and what he can do. It's time that we got back with Jesus, got that fire, let him do something in us so that we realized who Jesus is and we begin to declare and decree it and see it birthed on the earth. I want to talk about the 12th of July. The 12th of July, having grown up there, is a time where they celebrate the victory of King William of Orange over King James. It was the defeat of Catholicism. It was a, in a bitterly fought event um, that really divided the nation. On the 12th of July, the Protestants will get up, these orange men, they wear their um, little banners, and they, they go out and they parade, and it stirs up a lot of hatred, and usually there's a whole lot of violence around that event. You've got to realize, I grew up in the Troubles, in the 70s and 80s. I saw a nation truly at war with each other. I saw things that I don't ever want to remember. But in 1859, God stepped in and everything changed. I want to share an account of the 12th of July in 1859. Just to show you that revival steps in, it changes everything. You may look and say, it's too far gone. But let me tell you, but God. You have no comprehension what God can do if we just begin to pray and seek Him. Listen to this. What gracious movement reached Belfast. I joined an organization that had come to the help of the Lord, and the field assigned to me was that of the very famous district called Sandy Row and its adjuncts, where the people would be taught to catch the papist birds by throwing stones at them. And that, of course, is the Catholics. Yes, the essence of Protestantism and the conversion of the Romanists to the Catholics in that region consisted in the abundant brickbats and bludgeons. But the old war cries were now hushed by a higher voice, and in few parts of our beloved land was a short sermon preached, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Then in this very district, the cases of prostration were very numerous at the mill, in the factory, at the firesides, in the neighboring houses, in the public street, in the prayer meeting, and in fact in every human resort. When the revival was at its height, Sandy Row was visited by persons from all parts of the country, uh, indeed of the kingdom. On the evening of any similar anniversary, I would have performed no ordinary feat to pass through these districts. But I had no fear now. There was no breaking of lamps of constable heads, no fighting the streets were crowded, but good humor and enjoyment were distinguishing features of the scene. Throughout the day there was none of the usual emblems of the twelfth. No orange garlands, no arches flung over the streets. The only regret I heard expressed was that the past was so unlike the present. There was no military or semi-military parade this evening. God stepped in and it changed. When God steps in, Everything, as I said, changes, and it's time we realize it doesn't matter how bad it looks. It doesn't matter how far gone things are, but God. In Derry, 5,000 people gather for multiple meetings daily. In Coleraine, united meetings of churchmen, Presbyterians, Methodists, Independents, and Baptists were held. These all working together with one heart and soul. In Belfast, almost every street saw people repenting. Some of the most prominent sinners, drunkards, prostitutes were saved. In Belfast, we saw meetings that said of 20 to 25,000. These are massive amounts of people gathering together to seek God. Listen, we can put on a big church event that maybe a few people in our city or community will hear about. But when God moves, everybody knows. When God moved in this nation, you couldn't help but know about it. Everybody was challenged. That is where we're at. We need to see God move so there's nobody has an excuse for not hearing that Jesus is Lord. I want to share because a lot of times we look at the mockers and scoffers. And you may have somebody in your family or a friend who is so staunchly against Christianity. So entrenched in the wrong beliefs. They mock you. They taunt you. They think you're a fool. Well, let me tell you what happens when God moves on the earth. 
One wicked lad, bereft of religious influence, posted himself near the entrances of places of worship and occupied himself in uncouth mockery of the converts, using such grossly obscene language that the minister not denounced him as a scorner in the words of Psalm 1. The 18-year-old lad was struck to the ground as by lightning, and after lying as one dead, awakened to prayer, saying, Lord, save me, I perish. After conversion, he warned all and sundry, never mock God's cause. We are about to see God move among the millennials and bring in the greatest harvest of souls among them. They are so strong in their opinions, but they are about to become strong, bold voices for the Lord. And they will pay an incredible price. But they will accomplish something great for Jesus because they will learn through a desperation that Jesus is Lord and they will be used mightily in this hour. I thank you, Jesus, for what you're about to do. I don't care how stubborn or how um, resistant people are. When God begins to move, He breaks even the hardest of hearts. But it starts by the church beginning to pray. I think it brings my next question. You look at the revivals, the revivalists. While not against marketing, they trust the Holy Spirit to market. And revival is not a move of man, which we've tried to do. Right? That's right. Revival is a divine assault. That's right. By God, led by God. Mm -hmm. And so... Oh, I can totally speak to that. All right. Um, in the book of Acts, they had no marketing strategy. The power of God showed up. People came. Mm -hmm. I, when the power of God shows up, I believe you don't even have to... The people show up. And then word of mouth. It is the, the Holy Ghost needs no help. We don't need any slick marketing. We need the power desperately. We just need to be obedient. And we need His power desperately to show up. That's right. the power shows up. It's all good. Uh, there, there's no need for mass marketing. No need to drive anybody to our ministries or our church because, as you always say, David, it's not our it's, anointing. It's about Him. It's about Jesus. It's not our ministry. Right. It's not our anointing. It's His. And you don't need the where in Acts three thousand people saved in one day. Where was their marketing strategy? They had none. none. But they had the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit. We need Him, not in small measures. We need Him fully. Well, there again, it goes back to the first question. Because what they did in the Book of Acts is do what they stood up and said, "These people aren't drunk. This we're not doing this." We're yes. not, you know, and this they is made that. The stand. This, is, this that. is that. It was prophesied. You know? mm -hmm. And then the Holy Joel. Spirit, then God moved. Amen. You know? It's just like Romans 1 uh, 16 says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power oh, of God unto, unto salvation to everyone Jews. that believes. To the Jews. Everyone that believes. Amen. Everyone that believes. Everyone that believes. This gospel is a whosoever yep. gospel. But wow, yeah, think about it. The power shows up and people get healed, people get their lives get changed. Mm -hmm. You can't keep people away. Yep. You will want to, you will almost be tempted to keep people away. Siobhan in Ireland said to me, um, I don't believe revival has to turn your life upside down. I said, I don't believe it can do anything but, but turn your mm -hmm. life upside down. Yep. I went out of question. So I'm gonna quote something here. This is what was written regarding the revival in Ireland. So intense was the desire after the things of God that as record of one district, whole townlands are awakened, all outdoor labor suspended, and people in crowds follow the minister from door to door to engage in prayer. In those days, no foul shame hindered the repentant sinner from expressing with all naturalness his actual feelings, hence stricken with remorse, men, women, whether respectable churchgoers or flagrant life, sought the, uh, sought the Savior with agonizing cries uh, which was an indication, not of any mental fantasy, but of a profound realization of a spiritual need. And then went on to talk about the, talk about the people, um, prayer and prayers, tears and smiles mingled together. Husbands and wives are locked in each other's arms, weeping and praying together, while those who had scoffed stand still and in fear and trembling contemplate the strange thing they see. And they looked in the cities. This is what was going on in the streets. It was a phenomenon. Mm -hmm. In the streets. Yeah, and we've never experienced thing, and, and we've not experienced anything like that. The closest we came was we're here in Pittsburgh now, and there was the charismatic uh, renewal, and that was in the 70s. And I can tell you that the presence of God was a very tangible thing. You couldn't go anywhere without hearing somebody talk about Jesus, right. Right. and it was it was a very palpable. 
but not to that degree, not to that divine attack to that degree, but it reminds me of the story in the Bible where the man found that pearl of great price. And he sold everything he had for that pearl. See, we, that's the desperity we have to get to, to find that pearl of great price. We have not experienced it to that degree like well, they did. I think there again, it's, it goes back to the, the, the second question is, you know, it's a move of God. It's not marketable. It's the Holy Spirit moving on the hearts of the people. Amen. It's it's God moving on the hearts of the people. That you know, not just the unsaved, but also the saved. Well, it has to you start know? with the saved first, right. don't you think? But it's just you know, it's not a remarkable thing. It's God's move. It's not Amen. what we do. It's not you know the, the the great ministry we have. It's just the desire to share Jesus with people and and to bring people in their lives. Amen. You know, Jesus into their lives. We, we need you know? that desperately in this and, hour. And it's in that move, and, and the Holy Spirit just moves in that direction. Yeah. You know, and then we'll see. That's basically the Holy Spirit's the market. Right. So we need, to, we need to awake. We need to wake up. And, you know, when do you realize in the natural you've been asleep? When you wake up. When you wake up. We live in an hour where God is looking for people that will sense what the Spirit is saying, hear what the Spirit is saying to the church, and will come back in repentance. In Joel chapter 2, there is an urgent cry, and it's a wake-up call to the church. The call is to come rend our garments, not our hearts. I mean, sorry, rend our hearts, not our garments. I look at Joel chapter 2, and we get the scripture, in the last days I'll pour my spirit. But it starts with, after the after this so there's a key event before that where there's a return and I should say it starts with blow a trumpet so stir up the church stir up Israel and there's a call to return and how much right now the church is very backslidden lethargic we need that the Joel 2 call is really interesting because it's urgent and it's coming with the possibility of divine judgment and the hope of divine blessing with repentance. If the prophets just said, it, it's all over, there is no hope, Israel is going to be destroyed, then you, you, you don't even have an incentive to pray. If you say, no problem, just ask God for mercy and you'll have it, then you become complacent. The prophetic message is, who knows, maybe if we repent, the best days can be yet ahead. Maybe if we cry out, we could see something amazing happen in our nation. But it carries that sense of urgency because you can't play games with it. So I think Americans, American Christians in particular, are finally waking up to the urgency of the hour. It's hard to do it during times of, of prosperity. It's, it's hard to do it when everything seems to be going pretty well. Yeah, there have been some economic problems, some threats to our security, but most Americans are, are, are living pretty well, and plenty of churches seem to be doing pretty well, whereas the reality is we're in a miserable, precarious state in the nation, and many churches are in a largely backslidden state. So this awakening comes, the Joel 2, the sounding of the trumpet, the sounding of the alarm, and we realize we need to wake up. We need to wake up. We need to seek God. He is merciful. He is long-suffering. He desires to bless, not curse. But we must act with a sense of urgency. You think of the ten virgins, five foolish, five wise. They all get the wake-up call. And I think right now, God is. there's a wake-up call coming. One of my goals is to provoke, to encourage people to wake up because I think God's about to blast that trumpet wake-up call in this, not just nationally, globally. And um, I'm interested to hear your opinion on, Smith Wiggles would talk about this coming revival being unlike any other. How do you see it being different? Well, we're in different times than we've ever been. Same human nature, same devil, same God. But with social media, what happens in one part of the world can be instantly reported around the rest of the world. Uh, the global terrorism is a threat that's unique in, in many ways. The, the rising persecution of Christians in the Middle East and, and in 
uh, other Islamic parts of the world, these things are intensifying. Uh, the potential for massive all-out world wars that we've never had, uh, they're just things that are different than they've ever been before, but again, same human nature, same devil, same God. What I'm expecting is God to move in ways that we haven't seen because of the urgency of the hour, sure. because of the world population of, what, seven and a half billion people, because there's still maybe two billion that have never had, heard the name of Jesus, uh, because Israel continues to find itself in a precarious and challenging situation surrounded by radical enemies, that it's one of those urgent times that, that we can't afford to have a move of God that gets wasted. And that means that this must be the Word of God and the Holy Spirit working in conjunction. I've appealed to my non-charismatic friends to come along with charismatics and help them understand how to teach the Word and preach the Word and be grounded in the Word. And I've encouraged my non-charismatic friends to be open to the positive influence of charismatics saying that there's more that the Holy Spirit's moving. If we can join Word and Spirit together, Jesus said that the Father's looking for those who worship Him in spirit and truth. He rebuked religious leaders saying, you're mistaken because you don't understand the Scriptures or the power of God. To the extent it is a both and move of the Spirit, to that extent it can bear lasting fruit. We must have something that combines the fire, that holy presence, that manifest glory of God that so radically changes lives with making real disciples in a long-term way through the world. Uh, anything less than that at a critical hour like this is going to fall short. Too many of us walk unbecoming of a believer. We have allowed things that we're supposed to have laid aside to continue in our lives. Anger, malice, and many other things. We have allowed bitterness to set up root in our hearts. All this must be defeated in the secret place through seeking heaven. Standing on the promises of God and knowing that He is able and that God not only is He able, He desires and He will do if we seek Him. If we keep knocking, He will answer. If we keep asking, He will give. It's time to press in like never before. It's only in seasons where we suddenly realize we're about to lose everything that desperation comes. Looking at the average person who's going to see this video, hopefully he's getting stirred, we need revival. What would you say to them that they could do in this hour as we press in and seek God for revival? First thing is they begin to seek God privately. This is the first, this is the last, this is the biggest. Seek God privately. Begin to spend more time with Him. Purpose to spend more time with Him. Find times, whether it's driving in your car or getting away, going to the bathroom during your lunch break with the Bible, getting up earlier, going to sleep later, canceling an appointment that is not essential, getting alone with God and seeking His face and asking Him for everything He has so that He can be glorified in this world. And then find out what God has done. Read the Word and believe what you're reading. And then read about past revivals. Watch things about past revivals. Find out what God has done. When you realize, wait, wait, this is accessible. These things have happened before. The same God wants to do the same things today. When you see that, your, your mind is tremendously open. You know, there's the old story about this, this guy that saved money for 20 years to go on a cruise. It was his lifelong dream to go on the cruise, but his funds were so limited, he just got the most basic package. And every day as the people were feasting, three meals, cruise meals, you know, this lavish buffet, every day he was in his room alone having his peanut butter sandwich and a bottle of water. And the last day, someone came by to clean the cabin when he was in there, and they said, sir, why are you here? They're feasting it. He said, no, I, I didn't have enough money for that part of the, 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 the cruise. I just got the basic package. And he said, sir, this is included in the basic package. And he had all those meals. He missed them all. How much more? How much more when it comes to the gospel and the presence of God and revival fire and transformation of lives? If that's available in this world and we don't take advantage of it, we'll be kicking ourselves 
when, when we look back, I, I've been in revival. I've, I've been in revivals that have lasted several years. I've seen the people lining up for as much as 12 hours before the services would start, getting online at 6 in the morning, for the building to open at 6 at night, for the service to start at 7 at night, that would then last till midnight or 1 in the morning, and to come day after day, people lining up like this for several years to get into the meetings, and some of them not even saved. Why were they on the lines? Because someone brought them, and they realized they needed God, and then you hear the people getting radically born again as they stood online outside the building. And, and you hear the people getting dramatically delivered from decades of, of alcohol abuse or cocaine addiction or whatever it is. They get radically set free. They get wonderfully born again. They come to our ministry school, get trained. Now they're out on the mission field producing fruit. They've been on the mission field for, for 15 years. When you see what can happen in a moment of time, when you see how the toughest cases, the roughest cases, the ones that were so utterly impossible get touched and these individuals get get an encounter with Jesus that changes them forever and the fire is burning bright years later you say God why can't we have that in our day and and ultimately God is willing to move and pour out his spirit if there's hunger and thirst on our end and we seek and knock until the answer comes God will answer God could take these few people and turn a nation upside down it would spread throughout the whole of Ireland. Now I realize, and I want to make a comment here, that it was not as effective among the Catholics, but people got to understand that in the 1840s, early 1850s, we'd seen the Irish famine, and over one million people die from it. There wasn't a lot of trust. There was a lot of bitterness. See, all the things must be removed that hinder revival. The grace of God comes at great price. It came at the price of the cross of Jesus. When you taste and see, that joy of knowing Him should cause you to sell everything. You can no longer walk with one foot in the world and one foot in the church. It's not good enough for us to turn up a church with our Sunday faces. We need change. God turned up in that hour. They had sought to try and get people in the church, and like us today, they couldn't. All of their marketing campaigns and all that failed. But God... When God turned up, they had to shut the churches and meet outside. When God turned up, they, had, they couldn't sleep for days. Ministers went for days without sleep because they were so busy ministering to people and preaching the gospel. The Bible says that He is able, in Ephesians uh, chapter 3, He's able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above and beyond all we dare ask, think, or imagine. It's not at the individual level, but it's at the church level. See, I can imagine many great ways and things of how to reach the lost. You get me another believer, and what I imagine, they multiply. Now you get a church of believers. And think about all the ways we can reach the lost. That's so much bigger. What God can and will do if we will gather together and seek Him. If we will join together as one and say, God, you've got to move. In a church, in a small rural town. I'm not in a big place. I don't have the, the, the uh, doors and, and opportunities. God can use you right where you're at. In 1859, they didn't have the transportation. They didn't have the internet, all the tools we have today. If they could do it in their hour. If the early church in the 1st and 2nd century could turn the world upside down and be in every community, how much more can we do with the tools we have today? The difference is that they walked as transients. They didn't consider themselves as belonging to the world, but they were passing through and they were meant to be a voice. It's time to get back. It's time to repent and let the Spirit of God have His way in you. Expose all darkness. Get back that hunger and passion for the Word and the things of God. Begin to fellowship. Find the place that God wants to plug you in so that you can be a part of the body of Christ so that we grow as every joint supplies. You have a purpose. You have a value before God. In Ephesians 1, it says that um, He has accepted us in the Beloved. A better translation is, He has declared us worthy of love. God is on the move. He's beginning to stir. 
and warm things up and looking for the response. In the days of the Ulster Revival, beforehand, many churches began to preach revival and those that did got it and those that stood against it didn't. Those that tried to formulate and make a revival didn't get it, but those who yielded to the Spirit did. You cannot make a revival. I don't care if you get up and declare and stand and say we're having a revival and you make all this noise. If it's not God, it's of no use. Because when revival breaks out, God does the marketing, God draws the people, and God delivers His people. When God turns up a power, people experience something and they cannot be quiet about it. Maybe right now you need to experience the power of God in your life. Because you need that change. You need that encounter with God. So I pray right now that first of all that you would accept Jesus into your heart and accept Him as Lord because it's the yielding surrender. It's the relationship. Jesus wants a relationship with you. I don't care what denomination. I'm not selling religion to you. I'm seeking to bring you to a place of a relationship with Jesus. All you got to do is open your heart. Receive Him in. Taste and see that He is good. And experience the power of change in your life. And as you seek Him, and as you look at the Word, which is His eternal law that will never change, and let Him write that on your heart, every promise He made in His Word is yours. Because He paid a price. He shed His blood for you. He shed His blood for Northern Ireland. And when they realized that, it brought change to a nation. And when they stood on it, they saw the change. We too but see it in our lives and we'll see it in this nation. We are built upon the rock of Jesus Christ and the gates of hell may attack us and may try all they can, but we win because Jesus is Lord. I pray you're provoked. And if you are, I ask you to begin to share this message and let us gather with more and more people crying out to God as believers with one voice. Jesus, if you moved in a previous generation, move in ours. God wants to use you more than you can imagine. Four men changed a nation, touched the world. Four men in a rural place seeking God, trusting God, standing on a promise. God can use you. God can use me and you standing together. Let's get this message out. Let's begin to provoke one another to agree together and stand and let's see the greatest movement. All of hell may be roaring and making noise, but hallelujah, let's take that as an honor that they know the church is arising. And the devil is getting frightened and concerned and making his noise. But the church will arise under the anointing of the Holy Ghost and power. And we will preach this gospel so that all may know that Jesus is Lord. Well, I pray you're blessed. And I pray that you'll listen to more in this series, uh, Cloud of Witnesses, and that it will truly edify you and encourage you and enable you to, to be uh, released more effectively into your ministry and calling. Be blessed in the name of Jesus.